and uh, uh, you're, you're going to introduce yourself in just a minute, Eric. So I'll, I'll start with John and I'll work across the people in my screen. So John, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is John and I'm at Case. At Case. Okay. Douglas. I'm uh, Douglas McKelvey from Edinburgh in Scotland. Deb. Deb Polk, University of Pittsburgh. Gary. Hi, I'm Gary Hirsch. I'm an independent consultant based in Wayland, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Ashish. Hi, Ashish, uh, Duke and US Medical School. Anna. Hi, Douglas is in, has invited me to join today and Stacey, but yeah, Hannah, um, Liverpool in the UK. Stacey. Hi, yeah, I'm Stacey. I'm an analytics manager at the NHS Strategy Unit working with Douglas. Welcome, Shreya. Hi, I'm Shreya, a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. Excellent. I have someone who says iPhone. Can you introduce yourself? It's me with uh, two for. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's the same. Okay, we'll ignore that one. <laughs> uh, Navid, go ahead. Hi, I'm Navid Gaffar Zadegan. I am an associate professor at Virginia Tech. I'm located in Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Excellent. MJ. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Mohamed Jalali. I go with MJ. I'm assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Fatima. Hello, uh, I'm Fatima. I'm a first year PhD student at Virginia Tech and Blacksburg campus. Excellent. Uh, Christine says she doesn't have a mic, so we all know who Christine is, or most of us know who Christine is. And that last person I have on my screen right now to introduce is Anne. Hi, everyone. I'm a first year PhD student at Virginia Tech. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and, and ask Eric to go ahead and uh, share his screen and introduce himself and, and begin his, uh, his talk. OK, thank you very much, Wayne. I'm not quite sure whether we say good day or good morning or good evening. You're all in different places, <laughs> but I'm pleased to uh, be in front of you today to give you a few of my thoughts. Um, albeit against a backcloth of what's going on in the world, which is, is not um, very, very pleasant and a little sad. Um, but I, I hope we uh, have still got a lot to say here. Okay. Right, uh, today's topic really is ways of telling stories about hospital congestion. I've been working in system dynamics um, and I just shocked myself by realizing it's about 45 years. And in the last 15 or so, perhaps a little bit more, I, I've been focusing on health. And I've often had problems actually starting to think how to best relate hospital congestion. We've done a number of studies, Douglas and I, on delayed discharges in the UK. Um, but actually conveying the complexity of that is not easy. So today I want to explore it using what I've now called cascaded and interlocking archetypes. So there'll be a bit of a mixture here of qualitative and quantitative system dynamics and a bit of mix of theory and practice. And I should point out that this is all done without thinking about COVID and of COVID of course has had a, an amazing effect on hospital congestion. So when I first started to try and describe congestion, I used stops and flows. And this is uh, what we essentially did in the book that recently came out, The Dynamics of Care. And I then used individual archetypes. I'll explain archetypes to people in a moment, for those of you who are not familiar, to show some of the unintended consequences of the coping strategies that hospital management had to put into place. So this is a stock flow representation of pathways through hospital. And this is my first sort of grounding of what we're talking about. Basically, this is uh, two pathways. It could be a lot more, but to get around the problem of bed types like medical and surgical, 
We define here just two pathways, an unscheduled pathway, which is accident and emergency across the top, and scheduled are what is known as elective pathways in the UK, where people actually come into hospital for a period of time, maybe even only a day, just to um, have a particular procedure that's been uh, predefined. Now, if we go through the selective um, scheduled pathway here, it's pretty straightforward. We actually are on an elective waiting list. We eventually get into hospital and most of us get out very quickly. The accident and emergency, the unscheduled pathway is a bit more complicated. People arrive and get triaged and a lot of people get treated on the spot and sent home. Now, some people need to actually come into the hospital and bed weights are quite a problem because the real problem here is hospital capacity. This is in both terms of beds and in terms of staffing, which puts a real bottleneck and a real constraint on both of these pathways. Hopefully people do get admitted and simple discharges take place. But in the UK, we have this interesting thing where a number of people get stuck in hospital. This stock here is a really crucial one that we call delayed discharges. These are people who are fit to go but can't be discharged for a number of reasons, sometimes associated with funding and associated with which care packages are available for them in social care. Now, although only a small number, this causes enormous problems. And I should say very quickly here that social care in the UK consists of a number of separate pathways through nursing homes, care homes, domiciliary care, and what's called continuing health care. The funding is crucial because people um, who go into continuing health care are funded and those who go into the other categories usually have to fund themselves. And so we have a second capacity constraint here, which is the discharge out of hospital. And I make this note on the bottom because I know a lot of you are, are in different types of health systems. In state control care systems, we've got these two constraints. I guess in others, you've just got the main hospital constraint. And I think a lot of what I'm going to say will apply to both. So what happens when we hit these constraints? Well, what happens in the UK is a number of coping strategies come into play. The first of these is what I call number one, where we move people from the unscheduled pathway to the scheduled pathway. These people are called outliers or borders and uh, possibly a few other names uh, colloquially around the country. And what this is, really doing is moving people who must come into hospital into some beds which uh, are obviously pre-designated for other uses and you can start to see the unintended consequences straight away because the elective wait list will be pushed up if this happens. The second one is that we talk about early discharge. Now when I first got involved in health early discharge was something people didn't talk about it was sacrosanct. There was a length of stay for each potential problem, each potential procedure. But you quickly get to learn that actually a length of stay is a management lever. It's a way of creating extra capacity. And I'm sure you can all start to think of the unintended consequences of that particular coping strategy. The next one is to actually try to stop people coming in at the front end, demand management. We can have diversion, which is probably the best strategy because this has the least number of unintended consequences and is becoming quite common in some places where we have hubs that people go to as an alternative to hospital. But generally demand management means uh, that the um, gatekeepers of the health system, usually primary care general practitioners, actually restrict access into the secondary care system when demand is high. And again, it's very difficult to quantify and even to talk to with some people, but it really happens. 
The next one is that we made temporary space available in hospital. We call this admissions overspill. People waiting, waiting areas, corridors, even in ambulances. And from there, they get slowly uh, taken into hospital. And again, unintended consequences are high. People stuck in places that they really shouldn't be in are very vulnerable. And the last one, is that we try to get people out of hospital. And at some point, hospitals get so congested that they even resort to purchasing their own social care. Almost a, a way of uh, getting a block number of people out of the hospital. And I put this statement on the bottom here that we're finding more and more that to even many health professionals working in that situation uh, find it difficult to understand how many of these coping strategies are going on and the chaos that it, that it actually results in. So I could at this point start to talk about unintended consequences on that diagram, but I, I resist that and I look at unintended consequences one at a time. And I'm going to use here a very simple archetype system all based on waiting times for unscheduled admissions. So the first coping strategy that we go for using borders is meant to actually reduce the waiting time for unscheduled admissions. And it does this, but it does it at the cost of a number of side effects, a number of unintended consequences. So this is what I call an out of control archetype, better known probably to some of you as a fix that fails, where we have a threat, we have an action, and we have unintended consequences. And I point out that these usually occur after a delay and across a boundary. In other words, these little arrows cross hatch bits here mean there are delays. So we don't think across this boundary and we don't think about what's going to happen as we put more and more coping strategies into play. Obviously, borders results in cancelled elective operations. It means that elective patients sometimes then need to be admitted as emergencies and they make the waiting time worse. That those cancelled operations mean more people need social care, so social care capacity gets eroded delayed discharges go up, and again, waiting times go up. And another one is that we result in inefficient treatment. We even go so far as to say we lose people in large hospitals because we have boarded them into so many different places. So time in hospital goes up, infections go up, and all of these conspire to actually cause waiting times to go up rather than go down. So an archetype here is a way of thinking about a threat, a problem, an action we take, its intended consequence and its unintended consequence. I'll talk more about archetypes in a moment. I'll just quickly go through the other coping strategies. Second one is early discharge. Possibly, possibility here is of serious readmissions. And you'll find that I actually provide quite a lot of evidence for these um, in, in the book, in, in the book, Did the Dynamics of Care. Readmissions is a real problem. If we try to reduce referrals to hospital, that's demand management, we actually back up an unmet need in society, which gives us future referrals. And this puts enormous strain on families, on women in particular, and on society in general. Overspill waiting areas also have a whole raft of problems. They cause closure of regular clinical facilities. They cause long-term patients to be admitted as emergencies. Social care is eroded again, and also treatment efficiency is affected. So these five coping strategies are a real problem and it's quite difficult because of their complexity, the number of them and the number of unintended consequences, it's quite difficult to 
show this and describe it in a concise way. That's my challenge. Sorry, I forgot to mention the last one. Spot purchase of social care capacity has a set of unintended consequences also. So I was a bit um, disappointed with just describing them in that way. And so I started to think more around generic archetypes. And I'm just gonna spend maybe two or three minutes here for those who aren't familiar, telling you a little bit more about archetypes. Excuse me whilst I have a sip. I wrote a paper in about 2004, condensing archetypes down into four simple types, based on the premise that there were only two types of feedback loop, reinforcing and balancing. So there are only four ways in which we can order those loops. We can have reinforcing and balancing, whereby some attempt to achieve, that achievement is undermined by a balancing loop, and I call that a generic underachievement archetype. The more common versions of that that you will see in many, many papers include limits to success and tragedy of the commons. The second way is to put a balancing loop and a reinforcing loop. This is where we have a threat and we try to solve it, but it gets out of hand. We get reinforcing feedback that actually gets it out of control. And we sometimes call this a fix that fails or shifting the burden. And we've obviously got two other permutations or orderings here, reinforcing and reinforcing and balancing and balancing. I'm not gonna say anything about those two because my talk today concentrates on the first two. Very simply, the underachievement archetype means that we have an opportunity, we take an action to realize it, we hope that will give us more opportunities and we get growth. The unintended consequence means that the growth in the future gets affected after a delay and across a boundary. And I use this symbol here to actually show the boundary that we choose not to look across. We choose to often ignore the unintended consequences, which undermine our opportunity and actually cause us to underachieve what we try to achieve. The second archetype is where we have a balancing loop, a threat that we try to alleviate to remove the threat. But again, we have unintended consequences across a boundary after a delay that causes the threat to get worse. So the typical behavior of this over time is where we apply our action. It works for a while, but it comes back. We apply it again and it comes back. And you can think of a classic example in the context we're talking about here of putting beds into hospitals as a solution. All that happens is that they, we put beds in, it relieves congestion, but they fill up. We put more beds in and we're on to this growth curve that we don't want. Now, I also want to mention one other facet of archetypes that I've always been interested in and that is that I've separated in my work problem archetypes from solution archetypes. Initially, a lot of these uh, descriptions of archetypes contained a mix of problem and solution links. But I think of a solution as follows. Take the generic, un generic underachievement archetype. We put an action in, we try to get some sort of opportunity stimulated and we get the unintended consequence. Now, if we could, in parallel with the opportunity, actually leap over the boundary and address and anticipate the unintended consequence, we can actually re-establish a reinforcing loop to give us the same effect as our intended action. And solutions are often worth work looking for, and I'll mention one in the context of health in a moment. Before I do, I'm going to very, very briefly mention cascaded archetypes, since that's what I'm moving on to today. Rather than use the archetypes on their own, I use them in tandem. Now, this is where one archetype creates an unintended consequence, 
And that unintended consequence becomes the driver of the next archetype. And so we have a chain or a cascade of archetypes. If I was to try and draw this as I have done on the back of the health example, in a generic form, it would look something like this. We start with one archetype where we're trying to achieve something and it gets undermined. We then are faced with an unintended consequence. And if there is no solution available, we have to address it with more action. So now we take action to address the unintended consequence. And surprise, surprise, we create unintended consequence number two. And we can go on like this. We now have an un unintended consequence here. And we pick, take some other action. And this gives us an unintended effect. And if I put these around four, we can start to see that this might eventually feed back on itself. Now, a point of caution here. Archetypes are just extracted feedback loops from models and from reality to show a specific effect in actual operation. And we've got to be very careful because they're all part of the system that effectively they all feed back on one another. And there is some choice required here as to which archetypes we actually show as interlocking with the others. And I choose the fourth here because this is actually the way I did it in the health example. Right, let me briefly move on now, quickly move on to the health example. I'm gonna use three of these cascaded archetypes to describe hospital congestion. I start now with an underachievement archetype. I could just start with something like a problem like delayed discharges or unscheduled waits. But I actually thought, no, we've got to look where unscheduled waits come from and where delayed discharges come from. So I started looking at the demand for healthcare. So the population grows, the demand goes up, numbers of waiting for hospital admission go up and admissions go up. And I should point out that really demand has always been thought of as being rather cyclic. We have winter pressures and we have summer uh, less pressures, but this is changing and it's becoming pressure all the year round. Now, what I postulate here is that this creates a number of effects. Hospital capacity is required for hospital admissions. And so we're back to my stock flow diagram, the first constraint here. Hospital admissions allow us to do the interventions. And the reason this is seen as a reinforcing loop by me is that I think hospitals are a victim of their own success. They actually create a reinforcing demand. And I started to think here, well, if we always look at where problems come from, we should maybe always start archetypes by looking for the underlying reinforcing process. Right, this is beginning to look more like one of my archetypes here now, because one of the problems we have is not only that health capacity restricts admissions, but discharge does. The more admissions we do, the more delayed discharges we get, and the more admissions are, are affected and blocked. And of course, here we're talking about delayed discharges being a function of social care capacity. And this is where I start with my first of my cascaded archetypes. But let's pop back for a moment to the idea that there's always a solution. Can we take anything from this loop and actually use it to unblock the unintended consequence? Well, we can. We could invest more in social care. Now, this is a really crucial issue because Social care in the United Kingdom is vastly underfunded, all aspects of it. And what I'm suggesting here is that whenever we increase health spending, 
supposing we actually then linked and balanced social care spending with health spending, we might never come up against some of the discharge problems that health actually is faced with. So the good news is there's often a solution. This can restore the polarity of what we're trying to do. But the bad news is it's very difficult to implement. It's difficult because, uh, again, in the UK, social care is funded by local government, is distinct from health by central government, and it competes with many, many other local government functions for money. Let me move on. Archetype two. We now actually think, how can we get rid of delayed discharges? Let's look at an out of control or fix that fails archetype. Now note here, I completely forget what I've been doing before. I start with the problem, the threat, which is delayed discharge. What do we do then when we have to face that and we've got no solutions? That's when the coping strategies arrive. So delayed discharges aren't usually tackled directly. They're more thought of in terms of what their effect on the admissions rate into hospital. Now, this is intriguing in its own right, because for many years we were told that A&E problems, A&E congestion was not due to anything more than capacity in A&E. It wasn't linked to the other end of the hospital to admission weight to um, delay discharge. I think now it's changing. More and more hospitals have very, very tight bed management systems, whereby they know exactly when people are being discharged and when beds are being freed up. But we still have to address this problem of delayed discharges. And my next thinking was that why don't I group my two sets of coping strategies into two types? One at the front end of the hospital, which is to absorb more patients, and one at the back end of the hospital, which is to actually expel patients. And I think they're applied at different points in time. I think the first thing that hospitals do is address the front end and they actually start to use the corridor weights and the outliers and the borders. And then we get into the unintended consequences. Treatment efficiency goes down, canceled elective operations go up, number of people in hospital goes up. And also it's possible now because I've got more space and, I, and I'm not making a a spaghetti type diagram, I can start thinking about some of the other unintended consequences. Efficacy goes down, infections go up. And this is what we've not looked at before is the fact that staff productivity goes down. Staff pressures go up, sick leave goes up, burnout occurs, turnover actually goes up. And all this feeds back to a decline in efficacy and an increase in time in hospital. And if I was to complete this, we've got one or two other things like rescheduling administration time becomes a major, major activity. We get feedback to patients needing social care. And finally, we get this ultimate bed days in hospital going out. So just these two coping strategies implemented because we've nothing else we can do leads to enormous cost and staff productivity issues. And this is an out of control fix that fails type archetype. We started with delayed discharge, we did action, Again, threat, action, unintended consequence. And these unintended consequences are a bit mind-blowing. They can actually result in 
incredible costs. Okay, what do we do then when we fill the hospital up, we fill the corridors up, we filled in all the overspill areas we can find, we're still stuck with what to do. And that's when we enter our back end coping strategies. Another out of control archetype. So now I forget what I've done before. I say, how do we address bed days in hospital? How do we address the space used and the overspend and the accrued deficits? Because now money given to us is going into paying off debt. It's not going into patient care. And the coping strategies we highlight here are demand management, early discharge, and the spot purchase of social care. Again, there are unintended consequences after a delay and across a boundary. I've already alluded to these when we were talking about the independent individual archetypes. If we overspend, we've got less money to spend on investment in capacity. If we actually use demand management, then we've got unmet need in society, early discharge, readmission, and we've got latent demand. And surprise, surprise, what is it that these unintended consequences interlock with? They interlock with the original loop we had by which we want health to grow. So we've got a situation where our achievement that we want as healthcare professionals is undermined by a lack of money and growing demand. And a lot of it is caused by our own coping strategies that we've had to implement. And I think if you tell the story like this in three or four interlocking archetypes, it actually gives some structure to the story. And I'm going to switch here to the full picture. I can now face people with the three archetypes. We have the one around the top. We try to achieve health interventions. We didn't have the money to actually unblock and find a solution unblock the delayed discharges. So we had to resort to coping strategies, resulting in horrendous side effects, and eventually were forced into trying to do not absorption of patients, but actual expulsion of patients from hospital. Now, why I like this rather than the other approaches I've used is that it fits together, it has structure. All the time I keep repeating, and I hope you've got this message by now, that we look at opportunities and threats, actions and unintended consequences. I stress the fact that we've not got any cross lines here. If we just use causal loop mapping, particularly on top of stop flow mapping, we end up with what I call a lot of spaghetti. And I have great pains here to stress that hopefully people can see the, the different repeated patterns of behavior that's going on around here. Okay, what do I summarize there? I find it's not very helpful to describe complex issues in a complex way. We could use causal maps, but I find them very complex. We could show strategies and consequences individually, but we lose the overall picture. We could alternatively break causal maps down into these cascaded and interlocking archetypes. And these are terms I've just made up myself. I, I've just come to the conclusion that Archetypal thinking is not necessarily some, something where we should look at individual archetypes, but we should look at how archetypes feed off one another. So I'd like to spend the rest of this session, hopefully, um, around things that you might help me with. 
First of all, it's not on here, but is everybody familiar with those five coping strategies? Is that across the world where we, we do these same things? Do all archetypes really begin with a reinforcing them? Should we always try to actually find out what drives what we think of as a threat? Do cascaded archetypes make any sense? Are they useful? Do they really give us the clarity that I'd like to find? How do we cope with actually keeping them freestanding whilst allowing us to show some interlocking between them? And finally, could we use this sort of thinking with other types of archetypes and other situations, particularly one I think where there are more multiple stakeholders and where we go across boundaries that are not within the same system. So there's a little challenge for you. I, I really tried to constrain that to give us time for discussion and uh, I'd like to throw the floor open at that point. I'll just attempt to, uh, to, to add, I'll find out, would people like to be able to see each other and talk without the benefit of the slides or do we want to start with questions that might take us back into yeah. the slides? It could we'll go either way, off. I think. I think we okay. do that and we come back to it when you need to, yeah. All right. So we're, we're open for questions. I, I can call on people or we can look for pauses in which to interject which is a little more informal and I think just a little more relaxing in some ways. So I think we'll start with the, with the format where you go ahead and take, grab your microphone if you have a question. And if it becomes chaotic, I'll interject and, and try to take a little bit more uh, guidance. Okay. The process. Okay. So I will, I would like to start. I think this is, this is a wonderful presentation, Eric. Really, I really like it. And this is very, very similar to issues that I've been dealing with in Singapore. And, uh, and I used to teach a course where I focus on trying to link uh, what happens in the hospitals and then long-term care issues. I did not present them the way you were trying to present them with this cascading uh, archetype, which I think if I knew about it, it would have been wonderful to really let them get the whole picture. I have a positive diagram, which is really, really big, trying to understand all this bottlenecks and all the issues. And the policies you describe is exactly what is going on. We tried the front one in the middle one and the back end one. And then the readmission issues came up with the hospitals now basically supposed to figure out how to use, use the readmission. So I think this approach is extremely interesting. And I'm, I'm gonna spend some time to look at your presentation and then I might probably get back to you with some questions. So thanks a lot. This was really, really helpful. Great, John, thanks. I'm going to comment that, uh, as many of us are, I'm, I'm mentoring uh, people who are newer to system dynamics, and one of them is solving or working on this exact same problem in Australia. So I'm pretty sure, or is it New Zealand? Anyway, in that part of the world. And I'm pretty sure that almost everything you said would resonate perfectly for him, and I will encourage him to watch this uh, video. He's not able to be okay, here great. Thank due you. to the time. But uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to reinforce that you, you ask if this was uh, likely to be similar across the globe. And so at least two of us now have chimed in saying in our part of the world, it's definitely the case. <laughs> okay. I, I can say I don't work in this space at all, but um, I found your presentation very clear. Um, so I think that um, I know that that was uh, your goal was you know to try to get away from the spaghetti and um, I think that you really did achieve that. Um, I think you were able to explain a lot of very complex things very succinctly and clearly. Um, so I thought it was very strong. Thank you very much. So just a follow up question, Eric. Uh, when you when you use the archetype, do you link it to any quantitative modeling outcomes to see how the solutions that the archetypes is proposing link to the quantitative results that you produce? 
Yeah, it, it's a really good point as to how you intertwine qualitative and quantitative. And you probably, those of you who know me, know that this has been a long-term thing that I've worked on. What, what starts this is quantitative modeling. We've done many, many studies on delayed discharges. We've never brought in things like the pressure on staff. And so I start to build that. In. And in fact, what I would really like to happen, a bit like Douglas said last week with his, his own model, is that, look, here is a study where somebody could try to quantify the whole thing. I see the process of system dynamics as actually being doing, doing a model and then speculating qualitatively beyond the bounds of what you've done. And then trying to say, is it worth us trying to quantify the next stage? Now, there are some really big things to quantify in what I've been talking about. I mean, how do you say, how much do general practitioners alter referrals when the system's under pressure? How do we quantify deaths as a result of these sort of strategies in hospital? How do we quantify efficacy going down? So there are challenges, um, and that's never stopped us quantifying things in this subject before, and we could try to do that. But I actually feel that sometimes you've got to go as far as you can with the hard science, and then you've got to actually say, well, look, there are a lot of soft things going on here that we need to think about. That brings up the question for me, or it reminds me of my question about actual empirical data that is available or could potentially be available if we put our, put our minds and our energies somewhat into it, realizing resources are limited. But how much empirical data do you have in the UK to actually, um, you know, guide, guide the, as you move towards more quantitative modeling? Please. Well, we've got enough to do the quantitative modeling we've done. And when we did the, uh, the book, I keep going back to the dynamics of care, I, I actually did a lot of research around people's thinking on some of these unintended consequences. So we looked at how common and how big was, say, um, readmissions if we used early discharge. And so if you go through the book, you can see various justifications and a bit of research around them. But, but it's, um, it's, it's a bottomless pit, really. It, it, it's actually an uh, in, enormous number of strands of thinking. And that's why I quite like just um, looking at some point at the qualitative side. Yeah. A few smiles around that. What, what were you thinking there, Deb? I was I was wondering. So, so, oh, sorry, um, didn't mean to interrupt. But uh, that um, I'd, I'd be interested, actually, if Stacey, who's who knows more about, about uh, national health service data than <coughs> I, I, I ever will, is is that um, when when we're building these models, then getting data can be a challenge, but but also. Um, we we often look at variables that seem to be closely connected, like the inflow to this stock, and then what's what's the stock and what's the outflow, uh, and we don't always trace across the whole system in terms of if, if there's pressure here, then uh, how does that show up somewhere else uh, in, in in a way that the, uh, the Eric's diagram points to. So, um, I I think. Probably there is the capacity to, to do some of these data investigations now in a way that perhaps there wasn't maybe 10 years ago. So uh, if, if I remember, I think we did something uh, similar when I, one of our PhD students was asked to look at some of these variables. So he was able to talk to the bed management team in the hospitals and then we were able to link the basically uh, when the hospital is very full how does that affect discharge rate? So the, yeah. the capacity, the, the, what do you call it, the, uh, what do you call it, hospital capacity, and then what, um, uh, the occupancy rate, and then uh, discharge, how this, how there was the relationship between that. And then there was also the issue about how long individuals have been in the hospital and the probability of being discharged when there's pressure in the hospital. 
So there was some effort to quantify some of these uh, salt variables, but these are all very important variables that we need to really figure out. One thing that um, I were not able to figure it out is how we can link that to efficacy, right? So the question is, how do we make sure that is uh, what you are saying is that there's a direct connection between efficacy and that I think there was some disagreement on the approach to do that. So I'm not sure if you can speak to that, if you have any idea on that. It, it, it's, it, it's difficult, yeah. And it's not something you can actually just ask people. Sometimes you can't just say, well, how often do you discharge when you shouldn't discharge? Yeah. It, it's almost, you, you've really got to get to a point where, where people start to see the point in the linkages that you're trying to make. I think ultimately people agree the linkages, but they don't like to face up to the fact they do them. It's well, like length of stay, you know, it, it, it's sacrosanct. You know, we, we are professionals and we have people stay in as long as they need, <laughs> but they don't. So you can't just look at the data. You need, I mean, the empirical numbers, you need the stories behind the numbers and that's why it gets yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's a, it's a tricky business. And that's, I think, what I'm trying to do. I, I'm trying to actually say here, look, uh, what do you make of this story? Because it has implications for data and it has implications for admitting that you do some of these things. And why are you doing them? Because this whole thing is costing more than putting enough social care capacity in in the first place. And I'd love to have be able to quantify that. I'd love to be able to say, well, you know, what is the cost of deaths due to this? What is the cost of efficacy going down due to this? Because it's got to be actually much more than putting some money in up front. Yeah, and how do you break down efficacy talking about the phenomena of burnout and yeah. disillusionment and all the other things going on in, 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 the, in the resources that are trying to keep the whole thing running smoothly <laughs> as best they can. It, it's, uh, it's seen in many different industries, isn't it? I mean, firefighting goes on. And I think one big message here for doing system dynamics is you've really got to tease out the coping strategies. You've got to tease out what people do in reality because they're often not upfront about that. And I think I, I also like the I also like the the connection in terms of the uh, financing for uh, social care and then the with uh, how to take some money from the hospitals to social care. And I think in, in Singapore one of the biggest issues is that social care is not subsidized and hospitals are subsidized. So when people are being discharged to go home, then the issue becomes money, right? So they want to stay in the hospital as long as possible before they get out, before they have to figure out how they're going to pay for all these kind of issues. So the issue is how do you make sure that social care is, uh, is uh, affordable for individuals so they can use it and think about how they can use the whole system in a way. But I think these are some of the policy issues that needs to be discussed. I'd like to think that it is a way of opening up more discussion. That, that's exactly what, what yeah. I, I feel. And it's no good doing that by too much of a complex means. You need to have a subtle way of conveying the ideas. And I, I, I don't think anybody has before used archetypes in tandem like this. And, and it, it, it's of interest for me to get your reactions, those of you who've, who've done any of this work in archetypes, um, wh whether that is, is, is a, a viable thing to do. Yeah. Maybe we need to recruit a filmmaker to help make it more tangible for people. <laughs> you just think about how effective some of the documentaries and other types of things that are, are made more visual and the, so the, the impact, the people things come through more clearly than they do on a diagram. And I, I think there's an opportunity there for our field to encourage the creative people amongst us. Many of us are those creative people perhaps, but there's a whole other type of creativity for helping to communicate stories effectively. Deb, you were about, did you, were you about to say something a long time ago? Oh, or no, I no. put it in the chat. I was no. So Eric uh, noticed that I was smiling, and I was smiling when you had held up his book, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, snap, snap. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. See? You're holding on. So I, which is just, you know, but I think it's a real a testament to, I mean, you had it right there, right? You had it, you know, yes. in arm's reach because exactly. it is, uh, you find it so useful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, no, but I've been putting other things in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Uh, also, Eric, you'd mentioned someone who knew a lot about the data availability. I, I think we got into another thread. And are you still willing to talk about the data that you are familiar with? Or was it Doug that? Yeah. I, I, I was wondering if Stacy might say something, being, being uh, a data expert, among many other things. I can't remember what we were specifically talking about. The thing that did spring to mind was the fact that we'd stopped recording uh, the national collection of delayed discharges, which is certainly a problem that Douglas and I are tackling at the moment. You, know, you have to go to local sources now to get information on delayed discharges. Um, and it's, yeah, <laughs> it's not helpful. <laughs> this, this was partly caused by COVID, wasn't it? So, yeah. so the systems were under such pressure that one of the things they were asked no longer to do was to, to report on the uh, delayed discharge data, which just, just at the time when it would have been probably most valuable, although you, you can understand why um, certain things had, had to be dropped. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a current um, frustra <laughs> frustration, I suppose. A, we're, we're trying to reinvent okay. it. And there's a lot of use of discharge to assess now where patients are discharged from hospital before they've had their social care assessment, but to mm -hmm. maybe a home bed or somewhere like that, and then they have the assessment done outside of hospital before then getting allocated a package of care. Um, and it's, 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 it's like a sort of halfway house. <laughs> yeah, and that, that seems to have been quite successful, but, but the message is that, that that extra funding is now under threat because um, well, COVID <clears throat> clearly has not been solved, but uh, in the UK, we tend to have a government that likes to pretend that it solves things. So um, uh, yeah, so, so, so some, some of these, initiatives that actually worked quite well and might, might not be around for much longer. Um, and one of our local areas did exactly the solution that Eric was suggesting, uh, where they took 2.8 million worth of the funding from the commissioners of the NHS and they put it into care home uh, staffing yeah. and beds and care I, homes. I, I often say, Stacey, that to me, not the sure win -win, it was. <laughs> it's not worked. It's, <laughs> Sorry, what was your last comment? Yeah. I said, I don't know how successful it was. I haven't seen an evaluation oh, of it yet. I've always argued that the win-win, like in any supply chain, is for the more powerful operator, which is obviously the healthcare, to subsidise the less powerful operators, which is social care. It's the way that supermarkets work with farmers. You know, it, it's any supply chain. Um, if you don't share resources along it, um, it gets screwed up and it's a win-win in health to actually give some money to social care. And I can't, no. I just can't yeah. get my head around people not seeing this. <laughs> but I think, I think this new idea of bundled care, which I think Singapore was uh, trying that before I left, basically is really trying to force them to coordinate with social care or those in the, what do you call it, uh, step-down care to really figure out how they can provide specific outcomes at the cheapest possible uh, cost. So I think there is some effort towards that. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, but bundle care basically is saying that we're gonna pay you X amount of dollars to care for this person for this episode of care. And I find the most efficient way of providing the care for them. So I'm not sure if that is probably what is driving some of these uh, initiatives. Yeah. And so Eric, that actually gets to um, a question that I put in the chat, um, yeah. which was, um, I was surprised that the hospitals had not started developing social care in-house, right? So I can understand that there's, you know, that barrier, right? Because of the different <clears throat> funding streams. Um, so, but it would seem to me that if they're experiencing this bottleneck, that they would develop social care on their side of the barrier, as it were, and that that would be, Cost, cost effective for them to be, to be paying for social care instead of having all of the problem on the healthcare side. Yeah, I think there's the, there are enormous barriers here. We're talking about, perhaps somebody can got this figure in their head, but the number of social care beds 
is in the what in the stratosphere, isn't it? How many are we talking? <laughs> Stacy, Douglas, how many? It, it, it's on a different scale completely. Yeah. And, and to actually be uh, considered part of health would ne would never never work. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think makes... there are intermediate services, um, but the, the problem with these, uh, such as the discharge to assess, as we mentioned earlier, the problem with these is, is, is that if, if the, the back end is congested, then they simply become one more place where people can be delayed. Um, uh, and, and so they, they, uh, they, they provide a temporary solution, but then they, then they fill up. Um, so... Um, yeah, I mean, in many ways, beds are not the answer because beds just fill. So, uh, yeah. I'm gonna. Stacey, it's time. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just no, no, going to say it's time for us to sort of put a wrap on it. I think some people have to go on to other meetings, but I don't want to cut anybody off. Were you about to say something, Stacy? That in response to that comment? No. But I think I'm going to turn the recorder off, and that becomes sort of the official end of the talk.